All right, welcome back. Just as a quick reminder, you can submit questions at boston.eaglobal.org slash polls, boston.eaglobal.org slash polls. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Max Tegmark. He is a professor of physics at MIT and the scientific director of the Foundational Questions Institute. Professor Tegmark's research has ranged from cosmology to quantum information and is currently focused on the physics of intelligence. He has over 200 publications, of which nine have been cited over 500 times, and his work with the SDSS collaboration on galaxy clustering shared the first prize in Science Magazine's Breakthrough of the Year in 2003. Today, he will speak about effective altruism, existential risk, and existential hope. Please join me in welcoming Professor Max Tegmark. Thank you. Thank you for, so much for that all too kind introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. So I'm wearing two hats here, both the MIT hat you heard about and also the hat of the Future of Life Institute. So Richard Mala, Lucas Perry, and Mayakita Tegmark, do you want to stand up too? Like local co-conspirators, yay. Thank you so much for making this all happen. As, um, as a scientist, as a cosmologist, when I think about the distant future, it's mainstream science. That's what I do and publish papers about. It's not science fiction. So what does science actually tell us about the distant future? Decades, centuries, giga years? Well, first of all, it tells us that if we don't improve our technology, we're screwed. The question isn't whether humanity is going to go extinct, but just whether we're going to be taken out by a supervolcano, an asteroid impact, or the dying sun that engulfs us, or, or something else. But the good news is that with technology, we already have ideas for solutions to all of these problems, as long as we don't accidentally use the technology itself to drive ourselves extinct even sooner. <clears throat> we can then flourish life, with life for billions of years, both here on Earth and throughout the cosmos. And there's more good news as well. We've underestimated not just the opportunities for the future of life in terms of how much stuff there is out there, how much space, how many resources we have, but also in terms of what we can do. You know, we are fundamentally blobs of quarks processing information, and there's no law of physics saying that this is as good as it gets. If you look at the great improvements we've made in information processing so far, they're still 33 orders of magnitude away from the fundamental limits of how well you can compute. And I'm really quite optimistic that in the future, life has the potential to transition from being just a dinky little, almost imperceptible perturbation on an otherwise dead and lifeless universe to really being a dominant force, not just on Earth, but also throughout the cosmos, that our universe really has a chance to wake up and become alive. This is something I think we effective altruists should keep in mind if we want to create, do as much good and create as much awesomeness as we can, not just limit ourselves to the next election cycle, but dare to really think big. For the rest of my talk, I want to talk about the impact of technology and how we can use it to create an awesome future. We're going to hear many presentations here at the conference about biotech, and about global climate change and things like this. I'm going to speak of two other technologies, nuclear technology and artificial intelligence. And for each one of them, I'm going to start with some risks, then some optimism and hopes, and I'm going to pose a challenge to all of you for each one. So let's do nukes first. Nuclear war. So what's the risk here? The way I see it, the basic problem is the risk is there, but there's widespread ignorance and apathy, even though the risk is growing. This is 1982, the largest ever protest in the history of New York City. A million people in Central Park, they were protesting against nuclear weapons. This is 2017. Most people just don't give a shit. We organized a fantastic conference at MIT just weeks ago. We had amazing speakers there. I personally emailed over 1,000 MIT students to get them to come. Five showed up. No. I've, I, I, asked, I have a hobby of asking Uber drivers how many nuclear weapons there are on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> the recent results of my informal survey was one guy said seven, the woman before that said three. 
I went home and asked my kids how much they'd ever learned in, about nuclear weapons in the Massachusetts school system. Zero coverage in science class, zero in history class. You can't blame the Uber drivers. So why should you, why should you care about nuclear weapons then? Well, here's why I think. Today, I've got guest and physicist Max Tegmark here to answer some questions. Hey, Max, why should I care about nuclear weapons? Because we've learned that they're even more dangerous than we first thought. The biggest threat from nukes isn't explosions that kill millions of people, or radioactive fallout that kills even more, or even a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse that causes mayhem by frying the electrical grid and electronics across a continent. No, the biggest threat from nuclear weapons is a global nuclear-induced winter in which the fires and smoke from as few as a few thousand nukes could darken the atmosphere enough to plunge Earth into a planet-wide mini-ice age with year-round winter-like conditions. This could cause a complete collapse of the global food system and uh, apocalyptic unrest potentially killing most of us 7 billion people on Earth. But didn't we get rid of most nuclear weapons when the Cold War ended? Well, yes and no. When the Cold War ended, the US and Russia slashed their nuclear arsenals but they still have about 7,000 nukes each, which could allow either country to create a nuclear winter all on its own, even if the other doesn't retaliate. But why should I worry about a nuclear winter when nobody in their right mind would start a nuclear war? Unfortunately, an all-out nuclear assault isn't as unlikely as you might think, because the most likely way for a nuclear war to start isn't political, it's accidental. For example, the time faulty computer chips in US alarm systems erroneously signaled incoming Soviet missiles and the US started to prepare for full-blown retaliation, or that time when Russian satellites mistook an unusual glint of sunlight off of clouds for incoming American missiles, and an officer averted retaliation just by ignoring the alarm on gut instinct. Or the time after the Cold War ended when Russian radar systems thought a Norwegian scientific rocket was an American nuclear missile and almost launched their missiles in retaliation. You know, these close calls keep happening, and sooner or later our luck is going to run out, and an entire nuclear arsenal is going to be launched accidentally. Isn't getting rid of nukes a national security threat, though? Well, no, because it's pretty clear that a country only needs a small number of nuclear weapons to have an effective deterrent against nuclear attacks, and any more are as much of a national security threat to the nation that owns them as to the rest of the planet. So given the risks of accidental nuclear war and nuclear winter, it's stupid, dangerous, and irresponsible for any country on Earth to have more nuclear weapons than it needs for deterrence. If we continue hoarding excessive nuclear arsenals, Winter is coming. Okay, I have one more question. Why should I spend my time worrying about nukes when there's nothing I can do about them? Actually, there is something you can do. The nuclear arms race isn't driven entirely by security interests. Money drives it too, and politicians would like to act tough. And in a time when they really should be downgrading, the US and Russian governments are both planning to upgrade their arsenals at a huge cost. And who does that money go to? Well, about 2% of the S&P 500 companies are involved in nuclear weapons production, and while you can't stop paying taxes, you can help stigmatize the nuclear arms race by divesting from companies that produce nuclear weapons. So what does that have to do with effective altruism? Thank you. What does that have to do with EA? Well, first of all, obviously, if we can, with a modest effort, avoid an accidental nuclear war, that's pretty effective as far as altruism goes. But there's another connection to EA as well, which has to do with mindset. Why is it that only five MIT students showed up at our conference? Because it's boring. A bunch of old people about old person stuff, whatever. They just, they just don't feel it. But if you're an effective altruist, you don't give a hoot about whether it's boring or not, right? It's irrelevant if it's boring. You want to geek out and look at the numbers, the probabilities, the megatons, the impacts. And you want to focus your efforts on what's going to do the most good. Regardless of how you feel about it, forget about this wishy-washy stuff, all boring. Doesn't matter, okay? This is, I think, the really key message here. So, for example, raise your hand if, uh, if you care about, if you're concerned about um, global climate change. All right. If you're concerned about global climate change, let me tell you that there are, if you geek out about it in a scientific way, there are two ways in which you can change the climate by putting carbon in the atmosphere. You can either do it by putting it in the form of carbon dioxide. That might raise the temperature by 2 Celsius, maybe more. Or you can put it in the atmosphere, the carbon, in the form of soot and smoke, causing a nuclear winter, perhaps, which might lower the temperature by 20 Celsius in Nebraska in the summer and 30 Celsius in Russia, or maybe much less. Uh, but there's been very, very 
little research on this. So if you care about climate change, obviously it will be against the spirit of EA to only care about one kind of climate change because you've heard more about it or feel more emotionally connected to it because your friends are doing it. You should be effective and you should look at both of them. The situation here is that there's dramatically less research on, on the second kind of climate change. And newspapers don't talk much about it. It never comes up in presidential debates or anything. We are effective altruists. We should look at all these things. So what should we do with nuclear weapons? There is, a, of course, the gazillion different opinions. But from my perspective, it's really very, very simple. Yeah, there are some people who, who want to build more nuclear weapons. Some even want to use them preemptively against North Korea right now, whatever. Then there are others who think we should get rid of them completely. Some who just think we should have fewer. In practical terms, there's only one bit of information, only one very simple decision. Do you want to you push in the direction of having more, destabilizing, or do you think we should start by going in the direction of less? <laughs> I think it's clearly in the interest of effective altruism to have slightly less to go to the left here, then people can quibble about where they want to end up later. How do you accomplish that? I think in one word, the strategy should be stigmatized. So let's compare this with Smoking. When my dad went to college, smoking was cool. The news anchors did it on TV. The hottest movie stars lit up on screen. It was a sexy thing to do. Today, if you see someone smoking on the Harvard campus, you're, I hate to say this, but your first reaction is probably going to be, oh, they're probably not a student. <laughs> and if they are, they're probably from Greece or Spain, <laughs> and they're probably trying to quit. Right? It's not so cool anymore. What changed? We stigmatized smoking. There were all these myths about smoking that have now been trashed very effectively, that people no longer believe in. And that's why smoking is no longer cool. In the same way, there are a lot of myths about nuclear weapons. The difference is people still generally believe these myths. If you read the newspaper, you tend to think that the greatest threat from nuclear weapons is from Iran or from North Korea. Even though Iran has zero nuclear weapons and Korea has about 10 very unreliable missiles, whereas Russia has 7,000, and they have, they're much more powerful, and they have really good missiles, I can tell you. And they've almost launched them at us many times by mistake because they thought we had attacked them. Um, or you might think, if you read the newspaper, that the greatest threat is from terrorism, when the fact of the matter is a terrorist attack with a nuclear weapon or from North Korea, maybe it would kill millions of people. And that would be horrible. But if we accidentally duke it out with the Russians, it could easily kill billions, so thousands of times more. And as an effective altruist, you have to geek out, <laughs> as in the spirit of, of McCaskill's book, and ask, is it really a thousand times less likely, a thousand times less likely we're accidentally going to have a war with Russia than that we're going to have a terrorist attack? No, it's not a thousand times less likely. So therefore, <laughs> the main threat is actually the one that we don't talk much about. Another myth is that the risk ended with the Cold War. Well, experts like the former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who was in charge of the US nuclear arsenal, thinks it's, the risk is greater now. Uh, another myth is that somehow shrinking your arsenals would make us less safe and less likely that, or more likely to get nuked by North Korea or something like that. Well, there was a really nice study from the Pentagon that suggested that actually 300 nuclear weapons would provide a fantastic deterrence against anyone who wanted to mess with us. So just for kicks, I looked at the 1,000 largest cities in the US population to see, would we really do a sneak attack against Russia if they cut down from 7,000 to only 1,000 nukes? So when I got down close to 1,000, I, I came across great metropolises like Puyallup, Washington. Raise your hand if you've heard of them. Okay, have you heard of Woburn, Massachusetts? That's the town next to us, population 39,555. They would be nuked, and everything bigger than them if Russia cut its arsenal by a factor of seven. Is, is that enough to deter us? Of course it is. Uh, what about uh, this myth that we're spending another trillion dollars, which we're currently planning on doing, a million, million dollars on getting rid of our nuclear weapons and replacing them by new ones that are better for a first strike because they have better targeting accuracy? Is that going to make us less safe? <coughs> Well, remember the list I just showed you. And then the idea that we have nuclear weapons only for deterrence is obviously a myth, since we don't need to have 7,000 to deter. We also have them for compellence. So we can <coughs> to persuade other people that we have them. Deter if deterrence were all it was, we would have the same number of nuclear weapons that China and France and England has, probably, which is a few hundred. 
And another myth is that we only have nuclear weapons because of national security, when it's pretty obvious that any self-respecting company is obviously going to also try to lobby for selling their products. So that if you, you can't, you have to follow the money a little bit when you look at anything in effect of altruism. And finally, this myth again that, that the main thing we have to worry about is that Putin gets pissed at us, or no, the most likely way in which a nuclear war will happen is probably by accident, because it's obviously not in the interest of any global power to start it. And again, geeking out a little bit, if you have some small probability each year that you're going to screw up, then the probability that you won't screw up drops exponentially with time. Not a great long-term strategy. So I promised you some hope also. <laughs> so the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was a, a deal in 1970 between the haves and the have-nots, where the have-nots agreed to keep not having nukes if the haves gradually got rid of theirs. That's the promise they made. Now it's become more and more clear that we were just kidding when we said we were going to get rid of our nuclear weapons. So the rest of the world has gone kind of pissed, and they finally went to the place in the United Nations where the nuclear powers don't have veto rights, namely the General Assembly, and at the end of last year voted the vast majority of the Earth's nations to start negotiating a ban on nuclear weapons, just like chemical weapons are banned and bioweapons are banned for being weapons of mass destruction that kill mainly civilians. New York Times didn't cover it, nor did CNN or Fox News, uh, but it happened. The only time when it got covered in the news was when Donald Trump did us a favor and actually sent out his ambassador to stand outside and complain and say, oh, those guys who are trying to ban this, they don't get it, which was kind of funny because we did a huge effort to persuade scientists from around the world to uh, sign a, this petition supporting the UN negotiations. With, so we have 30 Nobel laureates and from 84 countries and so on, and, and with 3,000 other scientists. And there was Donald Trump's ambassador saying that those guys don't understand. <clears throat> it's a really awesome initiative happening at the UN. It's a quite historic thing. It's mainly led by women. Beatrice Fien here, for example. So maybe if, <clears throat> if more of you women play leadership roles, <laughs> we'll have less of these kind of stupid problems. Um, <clears throat> so what's the challenge I want to leave you with here? This, these negotiations are happening now. The final round of them hopefully starts in just over a week in New York. This is the most amazing thing that's happened on the positive side with nukes for, for in, your, in the lifetime, most of you here. So do something to help. If you're interested in volunteering or helping with this to make this actually happen, which will, help, will obviously not make nuclear weapons go away, but it will help add the kind of stigma that really helped curtail smoking to nuclear weapons as well. Come talk to me, right? I have office hours right after this. Or Lucas Perry, if you can stand up. Or come talk to him. Or if you don't find any of us, send an email. Also look at our website. We have a lot of other tools for things you personally can do to uh, make your opinion heard here. And finally, study up. If you can go to our website, look at these myths. And... Uh, so you can protest when people throw them at you. Five minutes left <clears throat> that I'm going to spend talking about artificial intelligence. So I am fascinated by, by AI. That's, what, that's why I'm, all my recent papers are about artificial intelligence. For my research I do at MIT, that's what I'm working on these days. <clears throat> what is the risk of artificial intelligence? You've heard a lot about this before. There are the near-term issues, of course, with job automation, inequality rise, starting an arms race in, in lethal autonomous weapons, many other issues. And then there are longer-term concerns also, such as what if AI gets smarter than us and <laughs> bad things happen. Here also, there are lots and lots of myths. I'm not going to dwell on them here because I want to leave you time for questions. But if you go to futurelife.org and click on our AI page, we have our Mythbuster myth site there. Let me cut straight instead to the hope part of AI. So when well, McCaskill mentioned in his talk that there's been a huge positive shift here, which is that <clears throat> AI researchers have started engaging with this and take, taking these risks seriously. And if you want just a comical little proof, just, just look at the size of meetings dedicated to talking about AI risk with AI researchers and see how they've grown from Silomar 2009 to the conferences that we 
organized with the Future Life Institute in Puerto Rico and, and Asilomar. And it's not just conferences where there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. There's really stuff happening. The grants program we ran with the help of Elon Musk and the Open Philanthropy Project has now had 37 teams around the world been doing, that have been doing awesome research for, a number, for years. It's triggered a surge of nerdy scientific publications on many of the important technical problems involved in this. There's been an upsurge in workshops dedicated not just to make AI more powerful, but to make it beneficial. This was 2015 and 2016. It really, really exploded. There's a mushrooming up of organizations do, working on AI safety, all the way from MIRI in California to the Future of Humanity Institute and Center for Civic Risk in 2015 and 2016. Boom, all these new arrivals, not just from academia and the nonprofit sector, but also from industry, the new industry partnership on AI, aiming to make this beneficial. And so the AI community is really being heard and uh, started to engage the, with this constructively rather than just dismiss it. And uh, a lot of people have also, have also published a profusion of reports now full of opinions. Everybody has an opinion about what should be done. Don't always agree with each other, but lots of opinions. And uh, in this, the Silmar conference this January, we had a fascinating discussion about putting together all these opinions with a lot of back and forth over many stages, which resulted in the Silmar AI principles, which crystallized the opinions that almost everybody in the AI community agree on both in terms of near-term issues, what the sort of safety research questions are that should be solved and so on, things to do with ethics and values, and even longer-term issues. And I just want to highlight something really remarkable, that the first Asilomar conference about over a decade ago concluded that basically it's not so much to worry about, really. The Puerto Rico conference three years ago concluded two years ago, rather, concluded that, you know, we really should make this beneficial and take this seriously. But that was still a very wishy-washy statement, beneficial, it's like motherhood and apple pie. The Silmar principles, even though they have, they've been signed by over a thousand AI researchers, leaders in the field that you can see, in the, see here in the lower left con column, have, really have teeth. Look at the, the phrase existential risk is even in there, whoa. What a change that is. The phrase super intelligence is even in there. So next time someone says, oh, it's only philosophers who talk about this kind of stuff, ask them if they think Demi Sasabis is a philosopher. Ask them if they think Joshua Benjo, John LeCun, Ilya Sotskiver, the AI lead of Apple, or, and so on, are, are philosophers. <laughs> See what they say. Things have really changed. That's very exciting. So what's the challenge here for you, for AI? Well, <clears throat> here, I would say it's pretty clear that the genie is not getting back into the bottle. It ain't happening. So, so what can you do? First of all, if you love math and statistics and computer science, if you like doing research in AI, there are some really hard and important technical problems I would encourage you to work on. You can talk to pe people who are here from MIRI, from FLI, from <coughs> Future of Humanity Institute, CSER, et cetera, you can go online. There's a lot of, we can point you to a lot of great problems you can sink your teeth into. But for all of us, there's also a second kind of question. It's pretty clear that solving the technical problems alone isn't enough. Technical, solving technical problems, for example, for how you can make a super intelligent AI do what it was at some, what it was programmed to do, or how it can somehow be taught to embody the values of its programmers and stick with them forever or whatever, obviously isn't fully satisfactory unless you can also agree on what values you're gonna put in. What kind of future do we ultimately wanna create with AI? And I'm very embarrassed to tell you that I've been, even though I've been thinking very, very hard about this for many years, I don't know. <clears throat> and I have never met anybody else who persuaded, I was persuaded by the, well, either that they really had an answer that was satisfactory to everybody. This is, a, these, this is a super important question. What kind of future do we want to create? You know? So I would encourage you to don't, not just sit around and say, oh, well, you know, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. The future isn't just going to happen to us. The future is ours to create, okay? And there's no force that's going to have a greater impact on this future than the AI revolution, ultimately. So let's, so all of you, think about what sort of future 
really lights you on fire? What sort of future, what sort of society would you like to see in the next decade, centuries ahead? And then let's work together and, and try to create that future. Let's be, create the best future of life that we can. Thank you. And I have office hours also right after this talk, if anyone doesn't get their question in here. So office hours in general are posted at eaboston.eaglobal.org slash agenda. So you can see all the office hours there. Um, first question, you are doing something that is pretty unusual, I would say, in terms of the overall career trajectories of academics, right? I mean, you, you see a lot of great physicists and, and great professors in general sort of just go deeper into their kind of area of specialization. You have branched out and you have said, you know, what are the biggest challenges that I can use my sort of status and intellect to make an impact on? Was that something that was just always your plan or was, how did you kind of come, what's your, your arc to your current moment? That's a great question. I, I've, ever since I was a teenager, felt very strongly that the grown-ups were man managing this planet pretty stupidly, and <laughs> it really should be done better. But I really grappled with this question of what the best strategy was for going about it, because I realized that then, if I had just gone straight into some sort of activism, I would have had less impact. So I came up with what I, I like to call my Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde strategy, which I actually highly recommend to everybody else. I'm surprised by how well it's worked, where I uh, spent a fraction of my time doing the sort of mainstream stuff you're supposed to do, to get academic jobs, get tenure, yada, yada, whatever. And then also sp spent a significant fraction of my time on the things I was really, really passionate about. I was strategic about it. So like whenever I uh, had to give a job talk, I would downplay that other stuff. Be like, oh yeah, that's just a little you know, side interest I have. And, and I learned an interesting fact, which is academ academia, is actually very tolerant about you doing weird stuff as long as it doesn't take away from your day job. And I didn't have to tell them, of course, what the actual percentage was of how much time I spent, <laughs> as long as I got enough publications out. You know. <clears throat> and then uh, once the Dr. Jekyll part had sort of paid off and given me a platform, I felt I was able to have much more impact as an effective altruist because people would actually listen for instead when I, actually, when I did things and said things. So it's sort of a EAs are born, not made uh, answer, right? It sort of suggests that the EA movement should be thinking about maybe reaching people when they're younger and trying to sort of instill this attitude early as opposed to kind of targeting, you know, people who already have the, the status and, and platform because maybe they're not so influenceable now. No, I think both. It's never too early to start, uh, certainly. But I also think there's some career advice there. There's a spectrum. You can either go all out into activism immediately, <coughs> which I think th that will not maximize your impact, or you can spend okay, do no effort on activism, just do the mainstream thing. You'll also have zero impact. Somewhere in the middle is the magic when you have the most impact. When you do enough of a mainstream career that you can earn a lot of money to give away, or, or you have enough career that people will listen to you, and then also a lot of activism. So try to find that magic middle is my advice. Gotcha. Well, a bunch of questions here. Again, we won't be able to get to them all, um, but one that jumps out, the idea that we will get to, to zero nuclear weapons uh, seems to be potentially an unstable equilibrium because there's you know, clear incentive to cheat and have the only one. So what is your thought on that? It, what, what do you think is sort of the stable equilibrium that would be safe that we could you know, plausibly maintain? I'm a very pragmatic guy, and I actually, for that reason, I find that question very boring and uninteresting at this stage, because it doesn't really matter. You know, it would be a huge improvement if we go from where we are now with 14,000 nuclear weapons or thousands on hair trigger alert to Donald, you know, Donald Trump can launch our nuclear weapons without even asking Congress's permission if he has, makes, has a bad day on the golf course, right? To move from this to, you know, maybe the U.S. and Russia having 500 each or something, so my attitude is, let's focus on that first, <clears throat> before splitting hairs about whether we should ultimately go to 100 or go to zero. 
So it, when we think if about the house going is on fire, you know, first put out the fire <laughs> yeah. rather than arguing about what the shine, what the best kind of fire extinguisher is. Or... So thinking about stigmatizing nuclear weapons in general, that obviously means Russia sort of, sort of needs to take that seriously. Do you think there's any hope for that in the near term? And you know, can can Putin be stigmatized uh, into doing something? Oh, I, I think we <laughs> we need to be. be uh, I mentioned Putin because it's the Russian nuclear weapons that are pointed at us, but we also need to t stigmatize the ones that we have pointed at Putin. Of course, it doesn't really matter who launches first, whether it's us or Russia. We're all going to get screwed anyway. Uh, the best way to persuade Putin to get rid of some, most of his nuclear weapons is for Donald Trump to sit down with him and say, hey, you know, what do you think about we make it, make it a deal? We both cut make down a deal. to 1,000. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> if we, uh, we obviously are not going to persuade them to cut theirs if, if we at the same time spend a trillion dollars replacing ours by, by ones which are specially optimized for first strike. <clears throat> But I, I, I think Russia, if you look at Russia now, I mean, their economy is in pretty bad shape. It's really a struggle for them to keep this large arsenal. I think it, so it's a plausible interpretation is part of the reason they're keeping it is as a bargaining chip to see if they can make a deal with us. And um, I, um, personally find it very unfortunate that, that uh, even a lot of progressive media is so busy right now sort of de de trying to sabotage US, make a big deal of US, Russia, and make it impossible to make a deal. Because in the grander scheme of things, it's, it's in our interest to have fewer Russian nukes pointed at us. And the way that would happen is through some kind of a deal. Um, yes, Putin is not the nicest guy. But nor was Brezhnev, you know, and just that doesn't mean you can't make deals with people. So last question, because we, we are already a few minutes late and then office hours will be your, your chance to ask uh, additional questions. How we got here to, you know, all these nukes, 7,000 on each side, and then they're, they're sort of everywhere, you know, increasingly seems to have been a, uh, a race, right? Initially a race to, to get the bomb and then kind of a race to build up and this sort of competitive dynamic. Uh, is there anything that we can learn from that dynamic that led us to this unfortunate place that we could potentially apply to AI? You had a bullet on that um, uh, coming out of one of the meetings yeah. to tr try to avoid that dynamic, but it seems like that dynamic could very easily pop up again where people are sort of racing to get an edge and, and feel like it's kind of a winner take all. Is there any way to make sure that that doesn't happen? I think that's a really great point. Most bad things that happen on the global scale come from what Jan Talian likes to call a sucky Nash equilibrium, where you collectively get into some sort of prisoner's dilemma situation where everybody ends up worse off than they could have been. And one of the most common ways in which this happens are exactly arms races, <clears throat> where everybody sort of forced to keep doing things that force the other one to ultimately push everybody in a, into a lousy place. And, so there's been a lot of talk in the AI community about this. How can we avoid there being some sort of crazy race to get super intelligence first, for example, which will obviously encourage everybody to cut corners on safety. And I'm, I think it's very positive in that regard that the partnership on AI is bringing together the leading corporate players and also increasingly academic institutions to, to talk about this and try to realize that it's not in anybody's interest really, to have some out of control race. It's much better that uh, people can, can take their time and do all the safety research and get everything right the first time. We, there's just so much upside. Nuclear weapons is sort of boring to talk about because there's either downside or nothing. AI has an enormous upside also. If we can get this right, there's no problem that effective altruism cares about that AI can't help with in some way or another, right? So this is something which, which can be used to get out of arms races. If people realize that, hey, if we work together, look, there's this grand prize we can all share. So I hope we can do that. Well, thank you so much for focusing your career on helping us reach that grand prize. How about another round of applause for Professor <laughs> Max Tegmark? Thank you. Thank you. Office hours are next.
We'll be back right here with the next speaker in just 60 seconds.